Hey, welcome to Scoobytopia. This is the video that was meant to come before the Christmas one, but you know, life happens. Hands down, the most requested movie for me to discuss on this channel that I haven't talked about yet, beyond the zombie island era, is the 2010 film Camp Scare. So much that I realized I can't keep getting away with ignoring it. I know so many others have talked about it, and I might not bring anything new to the table, but hey, the video will exist now. I'm trying to get away from videos that are just about one movie in general, because I've done so many and they can get pretty similar to a point, but if you guys really want this one so bad, who am I to deny it? I haven't actually seen this movie in probably over a decade, though I remember loving it, so I'm sure I'll have a lot of fun revisiting it for the video. The 15th overall and second movie in the more modern reboot of DTV movies, released seven months after the first on September 14th, 2010, just days after my birthday, Scooby-Doo Camp Scare has gone on to become a big fan favorite for a reason. One thing that stands out to most is the embracing of horror. Scooby-Doo has been dark before, see the Zombie Island era, and it's touched on horror in the past like the Scooby-Doo Project, a parody of the Blair Witch Project, which I have a video about, but with exceptions like the delightfully horror-inspired series Mystery Incorporated, the franchise has a habit in the time since of being pretty tame and friendly, no longer pulling as obviously or freely from gothic or horror roots. Which is a shame, because the original pitch of the series in the 60s was actually so scary that it was turned down by the network and had to be reworked into what it is now, and even Scooby of the 60s and 70s can be scary as we've seen in my Scariest Villains series, meaning that being a little dark is in the DNA. So of course, leave it to Mystery Incorporated showrunners Spike Brand and Tony Cervoni when producing some of these movies to show up and give us one that really is drenched in appreciation for horror. In particular, the mini 80s horror film set at summer camp, a setting popular in the genre which even Goosebumps has tackled one too many times. The most obvious and iconic to inspire here, of course, is the Friday the 13th franchise, which you can see all over this movie. The woodsman in the movie might also be inspired by the legend of Cropsy, a campfire tale itself originating from summer camps around upstate New York, inspiring films like 1981's The Burning, and itself explored in the documentary simply titled Cropsy, which I remember quite liking. As for this movie, from what I remember and hear discussed often, it's a little overcomplicated for its own good, as great as it is, so let's take a look at it and see what we can parse of this spooky summer tale. The movie opens on a moonlit night out on the campgrounds, surrounded by lots of obvious CGI the camera forces us through, where Counselor Bird, voiced by Stephen Root, is telling the tale of the woodsman. Known originally as the horribly mean Jerry McCready, campers prank the counselor which led to his falling off Devil's Drop and hitting his head on every rock. Nobody ever found. The legend saying the head trauma made him insane, and so he became the woodsman. Daryl, another counselor, gives them a jump scare dressed up as him. The kids are sent off to bed, and he goes to check out a weird noise. The ambiance here, the night sounds, and the door slamming in the wind is excellent. And here we come face to face with the real woodsman behind him in a fantastically creepy shot, swinging his axe. Daryl runs through screaming as the boathouse they were at bursts into flames, a message reading get out as Bird sees the spirit who throws his axe and gives us the credits. I actually loved this song, Here Comes Summer, as a 14 year old when this came out. I remember playing it over and over, and the animation is really fun. I love Fred and Scooby dancing, I love the band moment at the end, very Archie's ironically, and just the entire art style. We get another fun axe tease that's just the boys enjoying a sandwich which, excited that camping means no monsters. They get a little scare that turns out to be Velma, and Daphne reveals they aren't even camping yet, just in a display model at the store, which is actually a really funny joke. You know how excited Fred is about taking us to his old summer camp. I am so excited to take you guys to my old summer camp! A shopkeeper voiced by Mark Hamill stops them, who some people think looks like Lester from Alien Invaders, which I guess I vaguely see. He offers some ghost stories, but the boys check out immediately. They drive past the most beautiful camp you've ever seen as Velma's surprised and impressed, but Fred reveals the one they're off to is actually the dumpy, sad one next to it. Fred's excited to be a counselor, and Shaggy's chill as long as it's not haunted, just in time for Daryl to say it's haunted, and announcing he's leaving for the nicer rival camp. As Fred finds the warning, I again love the atmosphere and the music during this scene while they search the empty camp. It's really giving exactly what you want in this part of a horror movie. They hear talking and find Bert telling a ranger that camp is being canceled because of the woodsman to Fred's pained shock. I've heard of camp rivalries, but this is a little extreme. You hit the nail on the head beautiful. Oh, I didn't say anything. Well, I wasn't talking to you. Me? Three kids show up anyway, not getting the memo, which Fred jumps on. Interestingly, two of them happen to voice alongside each other frequently, as Luke is voiced by Scott Menville and Trudy is voiced by Tara Strong, who together voice Robin and Raven in Teen Titans and Go. Tara Strong, who's frequently in the franchise in Little Rules and is a little more controversial to talk about right now because of her bad behavior, let's say, is pretty much doing what she does as Raven. Scott Menville, meanwhile, is far from a stranger in Scooby-Doo, from Wilbur in this Scooby and Scrappy episode, Red Herring and Skippy in a pup named Scooby-Doo, 
Tug in Scooby-Doo and the Ghoul School, Ricky in Mystery Incorporated, among other appearances, even voiced Shaggy himself in the much maligned Shaggy and Scooby-Doo Get a Clue. Fred excitedly shows the kids around while Daphne tries to comfort the other camper, Deacon, who you might be surprised to hear also is voiced by Mark Hamill. That night, Scooby's out collecting firewood as we get some more deliciously creepy atmosphere, leading from a false scare to a real one as the woodsman attacks. Running back, Shaggy opens the door to another scare, turning out to be Bert, maybe suspiciously so. They all go to eat, but the woodsman watches from outside, and this shot is chilling. I love it, this whole scene, this entire section. Fred wakes everyone up extra early the next morning, but despite his efforts to scare them away from it with the story of a boy who became a fish man, Daphne decides they're going next door to swim at the rival camp instead of the icky lake here. What is this? Oh, they're getting freaky in the woods. We get the song Summertime here, which is apparently a sound alike for Hot 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 by Buster Poindexter. We also get a lot of interesting fan service of the girls in this. We aren't done either. Velma tries bonding with Trudy, while Fred tries with Luke, but the rival campers outshine them. As does their counselor, it seems, as Fred sets his sights on Jessica, who herself is walking fan service right out of Friday the 13th. Scuba diving, Scooby finds what seems like buildings underwater when a fish man scares him back to the surface. The dudes save Velma and Trudy from it just for it to attack them, so they all get in the one remaining canoe until they almost go over the dam, then pushed all the way over by the creature where they somehow survive and end up back at their own camp safely. Bert realizes it must be the fish man from Fred's story, which means all the campfire legends are coming to life. There really is no other explanation. How about someone is using these monsters to try and scare us away? Why don't you just stick to being pretty? Did he just say what I think he said? Yeah. He thinks you're pretty! Hmm. <sighs> Again, that fan service on Daphne. Am I just being unusually conservative today? Some more great creepy atmosphere as someone lurks their way into a trap revealed to be Jessica. Some of their equipment has gone missing next door and she thought it was them pulling a prank, though Fred says he leaves that to their campers. While Velma's confused as to what this adds up to, the woodsman gives them no time to think with another jump scare, chasing Shaggy and Scooby in this scene that visually is quite lovely. I love the dark colors from the night sky, everything only lit by the moon above. They seem safe finally while Fred, Velma, and Jessica hide until we get another jump scare of the woodsman targeting them next. The shot of the axe hitting them and him looking through being so perfectly horror. He's right there again as they turn around, but Daphne and Bert come to the rescue, even picking up the boys. Fred realizes Jessica is missing, hearing her scream as the woodsman chases her, and again peak horror as she's chased to the infamous Devil's Drop. No choice but to cross on the rickety bridge, which is so anxiety-inducing. I would just let him take me right there. Not like that. Well, maybe like that. The others show up to the rescue, so he cuts the bridge as she falls, the boys surprisingly being the ones to make the leap of faith and swing her to safety. Yikes. Fred gives them a hand as they all realize the woodsman has just vanished, everything now being eerily quiet. Covering everything at camp now is the ominous warning, while the kids somehow slept through everything. The next day, the gang joined Jessica at the perfect camp so she can fill them in on the missing equipment from the Marine Biology Center, which must be in the lake, as well as a missing RV, which Velma tracks with GPS, finding it at Shadow Canyon. Bert realizes there's a legend about a specter known as the Lost Hiker there, and if you hear her wail, you're dead like a banshee. Fred decides it's time to split up, asking who wants to check the lake with him. I'm a certified scuba instructor. <laughs> what was that, Daph? Huh? Nothing. I'll go with you. The boys pass on Shadow Canyon, going for the dining hall instead, so Velma suggests they bring Deacon. While we'll off to find the RV, the GPS dies on Velma, but Trudy finds tire tracks to follow. Team Lake, meanwhile, find what seems like an underwater town when they're attacked again. This scene being fairly intense, especially if you have a fear of drowning or being under the water this long, like the Lassophobia. Another solid scene for a horror movie. Things like Daphne getting grabbed while the music becomes more intense as they barely make it into a cave, it's just solid stuff. Thanks to Daphne. Anytime, Freddy. Back at the dining hall, Deacon thinks they should stay here as Daryl calls them out for not going here, leading the campers to throw food at them mercilessly, the three escaping through the woods and falling off the cliffside. In the canyon, the team finds the RV tracks just disappear into the rock when the other three ride right into it, revealing a metal sound as Bert catches on that this is literally the RV, just painted. Inside, it seems someone has been staked out and using the missing sonar equipment, and thanks to Trudy, they hack in and find they're searching the bottom of the lake. Back in the cave, much like Scooby and Shaggy often do, the Minor 49er episode in Chill Out come to mind. Luke lights a candle just for them to realize it's dynamite. Jessica sees the explosion open an escape route at least. The wail of the specter unfortunately rings out in the canyon, and she suddenly flies through the air, chasing the team in their jeep as she tries to go in for the kill. Another great jump scare as Velma thinks they're safe, only to turn back around and see her. As fun as this is, I do agree with others that by this point the movie's a little overstuffed. This is maybe a little much, but it's not terrible as the team escape and the specter is crushed. Everyone gets together, Velma realizing the sonar equipment was for the underwater town, but they can't believe the reason for the dynamite in the cave. Deacon says someone 
Everyone clearly doesn't want them here, though, and is leaving for the other camp, them having to guilt the boys to stay, while Luke is enthusiastic about remaining with the team, and even Trudy has found camaraderie. Jessica has to return anyway, so she takes Deacon with her, and the gang decide to return to the shopkeeper for information. He reveals the town underwater was an old mining town, but everyone was moved out, the area was dammed, and turned into the lake. However, the town was home to one specific dangerous gangster who allegedly hid his stolen treasure somewhere in the town, or so the legend goes, it now being lost forever in the lake after the town was flooded. They learn that before the gangster died, his cellmate Babyface Beretti learned of how to find the treasure, specifically that the steeple will reveal the location on the summer solstice, which is today. Shaggy notes the guy is too short to be the woodsman though and must have help, and Fred wonders why scare them from camp. Thelma finally realizes the dynamite is to blow the dam and more easily access the treasure, which would flood the camp, meaning the others back there are in danger. There they find everything destroyed, Bert and the kids hiding in fear. Fred comforts Luke, finally getting to be a real counselor as they all have a moment. Thelma realizes the woodsman must think the camp is empty now though, and sure enough the dam is hit, bursting everywhere as they rush to the van. As everything is destroyed and washed away, we get this always classic joke. If you're back here, then who's driving? Hey Scoob, I didn't know you could drive. I damn. They nearly make it across the treacherous waters and back to land, and they look over to see the lake disappear and the underwater town finally being flushed out. We even see the theater is still set to show white heat and the public enemy, both being James Cagney films. They explore, Daphne ruining her shoes as they find the steeple. Someone's coming, so Fred grabs them, much to Daphne's annoyance as he's all over Jessica. She saw Deacon headed here and followed him, but before they can wonder why, the woodsman pops up behind Scooby, and the shot of him swinging the axe is great again. Deacon gets them to come hide with him, locking them in a cell. Shockingly, the little boy, weirdly voiced by Mark Hamill, takes his wig and glasses off to reveal he's Babyface Beretti. The woodsman chases the other three into the bell tower, breaking in and attacking Fred when he tries to stand up for Jessica. Luke knocks him into the window with the bell. Fred finishes him off, but he grabs Jessica until her shoe finally slips off. Daffy would hate to know she kisses him and thinks, and Luke's here. Shaggy's erratic shaking of the extremely old rusty bars meanwhile frees everyone, and everyone reconnects just to find the classic horror trope of the woodsman being gone. The sun rises and the steeple indeed shows the way, Scooby digging it up as the fishman creeps up to attack. Scooby bravely attacks for once, and Shaggy does it back for him in return. Thankfully, Scooby's driving lesson did enough for him to chase and trap the thing. Unmasked, it's the woodsman. He's then unmasked to reveal the ranger with a crush on Velma. You think you got me all figured out, don't you, beautiful? Oh, I didn't say anything. I think he was talking to me. Oh, right. Elsewhere, Babyface is trying to escape with the treasure, which Scooby is able to easily put a stop to. As we get the explanation, the music score goes into the music score theme from Mystery Incorporated, which makes sense with the same music composer and same producers. I love that. The two of these guys, of course, teamed up with all of this, between the creature as they searched the lake and the woodsman at camp, but Babyface had to become Deacon to be on the inside and get them to leave to hurry things up before the solstice. When it wasn't working, the specter had to happen to try and finish the job, making it fly with the zip line. Fred tries to let Jessica down easy because they're too different, from two different worlds, but she just wanted to thank him for saving her, which I'm sure Daphne enjoyed. Wait for me. In your dreams, Knudsen. With both camps now missing a camp and a lake, Scooby gets an idea, and both of them combine into one big camp. Bert and Jessica now tell a new campfire tale based on Knudsen, the woodsman. Scooby playing the part to scare the kids this time. Scooby Dooby <laughs> <laughs> we then get one more song during the credits, Perfect World, which is another sound alike, this time being for Walking on Sunshine by Katrina and the Waves. Interestingly, after the credits, we get a little stinger of the Spectre, who may or may not be real as she jump scares us one last time. And that's Scooby-Doo Camp Scare. And the scare part is right. It's really nice to see how much this movie did actually utilize horror movie tropes and aspects, even down to the visuals, to real advantage. Even the amount of unusual fan service in the movie feels like it's leaning into how sexualized the 80s horror movies this borrows from were. Fred and Jessica being the obvious hookup during camp before one or both gets killed for having sex and becoming impure in morality. The Woodsman himself, I don't know if he's the most memorable in the world of Scooby alone. I think I'll let you tell me instead of answering. But while a bit simple in design, perhaps, I do think he fits in fairly well with 80s slasher killers. Sure, he's no Jason Voorhees, but he's pretty decent. This is obviously trying to be a more family-friendly version or introduction to enjoying the cinematic world of 80s slashers, especially the summer camp ones, and I probably would have loved it even more when it came out if I hadn't been 14 and already totally exposed to all the real deal horror. Even so, I see why it's lauded by so many as one of the best DTV Scooby movies, especially of the more modern era, which I'd say is since Matthew Lillard took over a Shaggy. Maybe it's just the camp setting, which always personally kind of bores me, but it does sometimes linger a little 
little too long here and there between anything interesting or scary, but I'd say it's far less egregious here than in the majority of the movies. It does have a little bit much going on with the ranger and babyface creating three different antagonists to scare people away, but I don't think it takes away from much. Geekin being babyface is definitely a decent twist. There's obviously hints with him wanting to leave for the other camp, but that could be written off as him just not being suited for the shitty camp. It's him literally being voiced by Mark Hamill if you realize that, which makes him stand out, because why would he of all people be voicing a random kid that doesn't seem as important? The ranger isn't flashy, but I did enjoy the bit with him flirting with Velma. Pretty standard Scooby twist of it being someone they met earlier. Jessica might be the most surprising in that at least two or three times she's set up as a tease as if she's the villain, and she was really giving off the vibe, so even during this rewatch I was really wondering if she was going to turn on Fred in the bell tower for a last minute twist, and was surprised when she didn't. Another thing I love is the music, done by the same composer who again did Mystery Incorporated among so many other Scooby titles, and I adore how he INCORPORATED the series theme song into the movie. They don't really share a universe or art style, but I love when the movie and current show have some kind of brand synchronicity, like the What's New Era had before this, between the show and seven movies. I was excited to almost get it again between the Guess Who series Trick or Treat and Haunted High Rise, but then, you know, Haunted High Rise with the Hex Girls got cancelled despite being fully recorded including the new songs. I also do again love the visuals of this movie. The atmosphere is top notch and really visually captures the mood, even if there's often some heavy reliance on CG that can't quite keep from being distracting. As far as Scooby movies go, this is definitely an easy and pleasant rewatch that should be ranked among the top tier, and definitely far from Return to Zombie Island, which I found out from one of my most recent videos is very much still as hated as ever. I think that's really all I have to say about this one though. For the many people that have continued to ask for this one, I hope you had a good time with however this video has come out. If I finish on time, this is releasing before the end of 2023, so it's also the last video of the year, obviously. Thank you for being here with me during this very interesting year, regardless of how long you've been here. I've genuinely made some of my favorite videos I've ever done this year and really enjoyed what I did this time. I even kept them all fairly connected like a proper season in some way. I don't know what 2024 will look like, I don't even know what the next video will be or when, but if I do happen to show up with a new video, I hope it's good and that whoever is watching this one likes it too. Until then, you can follow me on the socials like that, formerly known as Twitter, TikTok, Tumblr, Instagram, or wherever else. Subscribe if you like the video. Like the video if you like the video, please. I'll see you next time in Scoobytopia. Bye!